Hi, my name is Ed Nolan. I'm an A-level psychology teacher and today's video is going to look at a biological explanation of addictive behaviour and we're specifically going to look at the role of the neurotransmitter dopamine. So just a bit of refresh that our brains are made up of billions of um, neurons um, and these neurons need to communicate with each other in order for the brain to be active, to do things, to think, to respond, even for our heart to beat. Um, and so um, they communicate each other by a chemical called a neurotransmitter. Now, the neurotransmitters, um, if there's an increase in the neurotransmitters as these neurons communicate, then that will obviously increase the message. But what's really important is what are called um, neurotransmitter receptor sites, receptors. These are the things, if you look at the image below, that take in the molecules. If they are more sensitive or if there are more of them, that means that more dopamine activity will occur and so the brain will be more active. So in a sense, um, what we're saying is, is that how active the brain is in certain areas will influence the addictive behaviours. So dopamine is involved in kind of rewards, motivation, forming memories, habits, attention, even how our body moves. It really is quite an important neurotransmitter and is central to addictive behaviours. Now, how do we know about dopamine activity in the first place? Well, it's a great piece of research by Olds and Milner in 1954. What they did is they got a rat and put it in a cage and they attached an electrode, very similar to that picture there, electrode to the rat's head to different regions of the brain. And what they did is when it went into one corner of its cage, they um, excited the electrode to cause a elect small electric current to go into that part of the brain, so therefore activating that part of the brain. And what they found was um, when they switched the electrodes off, the rats went back to the corner that they um, had been when the electrodes went off. And so what that means is the rats were going in that corner of the room to gain some sense of reward that they had when their brain had been activated. So what they concluded was is that area of the brain is a pleasure centre of the brain. And they didn't particularly specifically look at dopamine at that time, but it's the dopamine activity in that pleasure centre that influences addictive behaviours. So let's look at dopamine. Dopamine runs along four dopaminergic pathways, three of which are involved in addictive behaviour. Okay, that's the mesolimbic pathway, the nigrostriatal pathway, and the mesocortical pathway. Now, all of these pathways start with an area of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. Okay, so if we think of these pathways like information motorways that go to the brain to drop off um, kind of activity, to tell the brain, you need to be active, you need to be active. Okay, um, the kind of starting position that where they get that information from is called the VTA. Now, all three start in the same place. So when the VTA starts dopamine activity, it then has a knock on effect all the way down the pathway, dopamine, dopamine between each neuron, sending out information. So one of those is really important is the mesolimbic pathway. So it, it starts in the ventral tegmental area and it sends information to what's called the nucleus accumbens. And through the nucleus accumbens, we get a sense of pleasure. That's where Olds and Milner, that's the part of the brain that they were exciting. There's also an aspect called the amygdala, um, and that's to do with how we remember the kind of emotional memories of a of what is going on. So if you think about somebody who drinks, may think about um, when they had an alcoholic drink, it gives them a pleasurable memory and they say, hey, I want to do that again. Now, the reason there's a star on there is because for my students, these are extension tasks. So we're not really going to mention any further, but I will put some links at the end of the video. Um, so the other pathway that's really important, apart from the mesolimbic pathway, is what we call the mesocortical pathway. And as you can see, it goes all the way around um, the cortex of the brain, sending information. Well, the part that we're interested in is the prefrontal cortex, where we do our planning and our thinking, because that's obviously a central part to addictions. And so we'll look at dopamine activity there. Now, another part is the nigrostriatal 
pathway that goes to what's called the stratum part of the brain. Um, and there's a, a part there called the dorsal stratum. So it's dopamine activity to the dorsal stratum. And that creates habits. Um, we're not going to talk any more further. Once again, I'll put a link. But I think about my students and my students, when they leave college straight away, they will light up a cigarette and they do it every single time. It's a kind of habit. It's almost an automatic thing that goes on. Um, there and that's because when they've been smoking they've been sending um, dopamine activity down their nigro stratal pathway and exciting the dorsal stratum so it's created this habit um, so we repeat that habit okay so dopamine explanation of addictive the behavior talks about it being a disease of the brain the reason they talk about it says the disease of the brain is we have normal functioning that has dopamine carrying out its normal activities but as soon as we engage in addictive behavior it changes that dopamine activities it ch so therefore changes the way the brain works so it creates a kind of medical reason a disease of the brain and what happens is is that the the addictive behavior hijacks that brain the dopamine activity that is increased through engaging in addictive behavior changes the brain the way the brain works so that brain plasticity means that the brain changes how it's functioning according to stimuli really um, that's going on and whether that's chemical stimuli or whether that's experiential stimuli and it changes the brain and it does that through dopamine activity okay so let's talk about addiction how do addictions start how do they start well the idea is they start by activity dopamine activity in the mesolimbic pathway now what the mesolimbic pathway does is it's made there so if we eat a food or do something um, uh, we want to repeat the brain gives us a pleasurable response so you can have a look at my little brain there he's really smiling that happens when I eat marmite when I put marmite on a bit of toast and I eat it I'm like oh yummy the dopamine activity down my mesolimbic pathway just goes bonkers and I feel really good I get a feeling of euphoria or what we call a buzz or a high and that's what was happening with Olds and Mills rats they were stimulating that pleasure um, pathway so what that does is it's meant to um, help us repeat good behavior that kind of helps us survive. Well, unfortunately, addictive behavior also links in that. So instead of our brain adapting or our dopamine levels adapting to, re so we repeat a good behavior for our survival, they, what they do is they stimulate and help us repeat behavior that's not so good. And therefore it becomes maladaptive it means the changes to the brain are dangerous to us are harmful rather than helpful and so what we do well we, what happens is is in the ventral tegmental area when we engage in addictive behavior it sends a dopamine activity so the, this message down the mesocortical sorry mesolimbic pathway and it stimulates an area of our brain called the nucleus accumbens. And that really is what Olds and Milner were stimulating. So let's go through this again. Somebody engages in an addictive behavior. So somebody starts to smoke. That then in the ventral tegmental area will send a heightened dopamine activity. It will cause more dopamine to be released and to received Okay, and that passes that message on through the mesolimbic pathway. Now, what that will do then is make the nucleus accumbens more active, or the brain activity there will increase, and that gives us that sense of high, gets our sense of euphoria, maybe even relief. So I smoke the cigarette, I said there, oh, well, I don't smoke, but a cigarette is smoked therefore it releases dopamine down the mesolimbic pathway the nucleus becomes more active and so then i get a, think, a feeling of relaxation or pleasure from smoking and so the idea is is once i've done that i want to repeat the behavior however someone called nora volko um, she looked at that and said well that's a bit too simplistic because you know if you stop doing it okay you won't get that sense of um, euphoria but you just carry on with your life why is it that addicts still want to engage in addictive behavior even when it's stopped being pleasurable 
And she said that's because the um, dopamine influences the frontal cortex through what we call the mesocortical pathway. OK, so and this is why the addiction is maintained while it carries on. So what happens then? OK, so the brain circuits change in our frontal cortex. And so therefore we start to think more and plan more relating to the addictive behavior. What we call salience occurs. So instead of I like doing this, it changes to I want to do it in that frontal cortex. OK, so many addicts report that they no longer want to engage in an addictive behavior, um, but they still do. Um, they don't get the buzz anymore, but they still kind of are motivated to do that. I apologize I said no more wanted. I really meant to say they no longer feel stimulated by it, but still want to do it. OK, so. This then makes addiction more permanent, more long standing. So it's not a case of I get a buzz. It's a case of this is the way my brain is now programmed. This is what I'm thinking about. This is what I want to do. OK, right. So let's have a look at this. So somebody engages in the addictive behavior as well as the mesolimbic pathway, sending on a message to say, hey, give us a sense of pleasure. It also sends messages along the mesocortical pathway through dopamine activity to the frontal cortex. And if you keep sending that message, it will change the way the frontal cortex works. It changes its activity. So it becomes more focused on that addictive behavior than other factors, such as relationships, you know, reading, such as um, eating Marmite or whatever it is that, that, that's there. It'll then now be focused on the gambling, the smoking, the um, drug taking or whatever that will be. OK, another aspect we need to look at, I suppose, with maintenance as well, is tolerance. Now, tolerance is this idea that we no longer get a feeling of a buzz when we get engaged in addictive behavior. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of covering up the writing there. But over a long time of use or continual time of use, what happens is, is that dopamine activity in your mesolimbic pathway starts to reduce and the dopamine two receptors that's one type of receptors that receive dopamine become less sensitive and there's less of them so there's less of the message going down that mesocortical pathway to the nucleus accumbens and if there's less message there's less buzz and this explains why people then need to increase the level of their addictive behavior. So if I'm a gambler, instead of filling in a scratch card, I then need to go online to do online gambling because the scratch card no longer gives me a buzz. It doesn't give me enough dopamine activity. I need to increase it to increase the dopamine activity to get the buzz. And that creates tolerance. Now, one thing that is interesting is that our brain then becomes accustomed to the activity um, and reduces dopamine activity um, and dopamine D2 receptor activity. However, if we stop the addictive behavior, we then drop down lower than our normal levels of dopamine activity in our mesolimbic pathway. So if we do that, OK, and also in the other pathways, if we do that, all the other things that dopamine is involved in also get reduced. And by reducing that, we get withdrawal symptoms. OK, so these are some typical withdrawal symptoms from coming out of an addiction, cold shakes, chills, sweating, vomiting, all those kinds of mood swings. The reason these are occurring is not is not just because, because it is partly because of the toxins that are in the body and, and changing, but also is because dopamine levels are irregular because you've pulled away from that addictive behavior. OK, and so if they become irregular, it has a physical effect and a psychological effect on us. So therefore, what we do is we then engage back in the addictive behavior to overcome those withdrawal symptoms and we end up relapsing. Now, part of relapse as well is because of what is going in our frontal cortex. Yeah, the frontal cortex also leads to relapse. Um, however, 
relapse is seen to be as trying to get our dopamine levels on an evil keel again. Um, however, don't worry, if you are withdrawing from an addictive behaviour, your brain also will automatically start readjusting your dopamine levels. So withdrawal symptoms will only last for a certain period of time. OK, so what have we learned in our video today? We have learned that an addiction can be seen as a disease of the brain because the brain changes when we engage in addictive behaviour in a maladaptive way. It's seen that dopamine activity in particular is linked to addictive behaviour, both starting it and maintaining it. So starting an addictive behaviour initiation of an addictive behaviour comes by heightened dopamine activity in the mesolimbic pathway from the VTA to the nucleus accumbens, and that gives us a sense of pleasure. But maintaining the addictive behaviour comes through dopamine activity through the mesocortical pathway, and that's by changing what goes in our frontal cortex here. That tolerance occurs because our, D, our dopamine receptor activity reduces over time when we engage in an addictive behavior. And so we actually, in order to get the same buzz, we need to increase our engagement in that behavior. And that withdrawal occurs because if we do withdraw from a, carrying on an addictive behavior, our dopamine levels will actually drop below what we'd seen as a normal functioning level and so therefore there are physical and psychological effects to that and sometimes people return to the addictive behavior because of withdrawal symptoms and that's relapse well well done you've got through this lesson i hope it's been of some use to you please go back and play back again if you want to don't forget the links that i'm going to put at the end of the video you can click on those to learn a little bit more and if you like the video press the like button okay i hope you enjoy your day Goodbye.